weekend, Iran agreed to provide more information to the International Atomic Energy Agency in its long-stalled investigation of suspicions that Tehran may have worked on nuclear weapons, a claim that the Islamic State denies. The move comes on the heels of an agreement that Iran reached with world powers months ago to curb aspects of its nuclear program in exchange for limited sanctions relief. The Obama administration credits so-called crippling economic sanctions with bringing the country to the negotiating table. Tonight, we take a closer look at the impact of those sanctions as seen inside Iran. PBS NewsHour correspondent William Brangham reports. One of the first things you notice when you come to Tehran is the air. A thick blanket of smog hovers over the city most winter days, especially when the winds don't blow. Many believe this pollution is yet another way Western sanctions are impacting Iran. Of course, Tehran is a busy and congested place, so it's had pollution for years. But a few years ago, when sanctions squeezed Iran's ability to import refined gas, the government began refining its own, much dirtier gas. Since then, the country's air quality has worsened. The World Health Organization says Iran's air is often dirtier than Shanghai's. Face masks are a regular sight on the streets. According to the New York Times, quote, Iran's health ministry has reported a rise in respiratory and heart diseases, as well as an increase in a variety of cancers that it says are related to pollution. In other ways, the impact of international sanctions on Iran isn't so visible. Tehran stores are full, shoppers are out in force, and many Western goods are available for those who can afford them. This electronics mall in downtown Tehran carries every latest laptop, iPad, and mobile device imaginable. But talk to middle-class Iranians on the streets, and you start to hear a different story. People are walking around, but few are actually spending. Shopkeeper Hamid Akhlagi, who runs a small store in the Tajrish market in Tehran, says while things may look fine on the surface, he and his customers are reeling from another one of the main effects sanctions have had on Iran, skyrocketing inflation, now estimated by many economists to be over 30 percent. Prices for everyday staples of the Iranian diet, things like chicken and rice, have risen dramatically in part because of sanctions. Aflagi says the cost of goods in his store never seemed to stop going up. One example, a single bar of Dove soap used to cost about 60 cents. Two years later, it's almost two dollars. The prices doubled twice, three times, four times. So that's made it harder for people to buy things. As Western powers have ratcheted up sanctions on Iran to force the nation's leaders to curtail their nuclear program, economists say the nation's economy has been badly damaged. The World Bank estimates Iran's GDP contracted 1.5% last year and almost 3% in 2012. The official unemployment rate ranges from 10 to 15 percent, but most analysts believe it's double that, maybe higher for young Iranians. This economic pain is made even worse because the local currency, the rial, lost about 75 percent of its value in 2012 and has scarcely recovered. I think that it, the main problem has been the mismanagement, but uh, the sanction made the situation much, much harder. Saeed Leilaz is a prominent Iranian economist, and while he believes the prior administration, the Ahmadinejad administration, badly mismanaged Iran's economy, he says Western sanctions only compounded the damage. For example, by constraining Iran's energy exports, isolating the nation's banks, and freezing billions of dollars in Iran's oil revenues, Leilaz believes sanctions made many middle-class Iranians poorer. At the moment, the labor force of Iran at the moment is three, 35 to 40 percent poorer than three, three years ago, in spite of this fact that we had 800 billion U.S. dollar petro, petrodollar uh, income, hard currency income. But people which, are 35 to 40 percent poorer than they were. Poor, yes. The even labor though the force, country had all this money. Yes. I think that sanctions always disproportionately impact the most disadvantaged people in a society. Mark Dubovitz heads the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies in Washington, D.C. He believes that economic pain has served a purpose. 
He points out that Iran's new president, Hassan Rouhani, was elected in large part to fix the economy and to reduce sanctions. And while Iranian leaders deny it, Dubovitz argues it was the pain from sanctions that brought Iran to the negotiating table in Geneva over its nuclear program, and Dubovitz argues sanctions should be increased. The goal of these sanctions in Iran is to put Iran's supreme leader to a fundamental choice between the survival of his regime and a nuclear weapon. And at, at the very least, those sanctions have now gotten the Iranians to the table, and I think most people agree that but for those tough sanctions, Iran's leaders would not be negotiating with the United States and our allies right now. But as we saw on our recent visit, many Iranians believe sanctions have impacted them in ways beyond just their wallets. At the Dr. Sapir Hospital in South Tehran, a Jewish charity hospital that cares for mostly poorer Iranians, we met Dr. Siamak Mersadek. He runs the hospital and also represents Iran's Jewish community in the Iranian parliament. Though his hospital got a donation of several hundred thousand dollars from the Rouhani government a few weeks after our visit, Mersadek told us because of inflation and Iran's sagging economy, which he blamed in part on sanctions, his hospital was deep in debt. Since last year, our loss was something about one million dollars per year. One million U.S. dollars? Yes. This year, we have more than two million U.S. dollars loss because uh, we want to protect the patients who cannot pay. Dr. Mercedek says those patients are the real victims. He says sanctions have hurt his ability to get crucial medicines for them. He says drugs for geriatric patients, those with multiple sclerosis, and those with certain cancers, including childhood leukemia, are extremely hard to get. Even though the U.S. Treasury Department, which oversees sanctions in the U.S., specifically allows for the sale of humanitarian goods like food and medicine, Morsadek says that repeated warnings and crackdowns about violating sanctions, like the ones announced just last week, have scared many companies away from doing any business with Iran. They say that sanction does not affect food and drug, but many banks and most of the banks in the world are scaring from USA. They say that if it, we transact with Iran, even for drug and food, they would punish us and the USA would punish us. So it's better for us to be on the safe side, have no transaction with Iran, so we cannot find a way to have our drugs. A senior Treasury Department official told us the U.S. does not target any companies doing legal business with Iran. Furthermore, the department argues that sanctions are not responsible for the drug shortages that are being reported in Iran. They point to data indicating that exports of pharmaceuticals to Iran are rising and not declining. They argue that if there are any shortages in Iran, it's more likely caused by something within Iran itself. Back in Iran, the economy has shown small signs of recovery. Inflation dropped a few points in recent months, and the nation's stock exchange has come to life. Despite that, the Rouhani government last week was compelled to hand out millions of free food packages to help counteract still sky-high prices. Whether the economy continues to improve and what effect it has on Iran's negotiations with world powers remains to be seen. Representatives from the United States and other world powers are expected to meet with an Iranian delegation in Vienna next week to begin talks aimed at reaching a final agreement over the country's nuclear program.